Thank you. It's a true honor to talk at Gavi meetings. It's probably where the international development money is best used over the years. So I will, I will make a short review of immunization trends and child mortality. And I will do that by starting to show you some demographics. I divided the world into four regions of equal size, and here are the seven billion people that live in the world. One billion in America, one in Europe, one in Africa, and four in Asia. And we know fairly well what will happen demographically. No more people in Europe, just a few more in America, and by 2050, one more billion in Asia, and then Asian population growth will come to an end. African population will double in the next 40 years. And before that comes to an end, by the end of this century, the forecast is that there will be two billion more in Africa. So 80% of the world population will be living in Asia and Africa in the future. Now, why is this? Why do we know this? We know the number of children per woman, which is strongly linked to child mortality. But not only. It's also linked to education, to economic achievement, and of course, access to contraceptives. Europe started to drop, to decrease the number of children born per woman very early, but did it slowly. America followed. America followed, had a baby boom after the war, but is now down to two. America from Argentina to Canada. Huh? And Asia had the drop much later, but very fast. And the drop in Africa started about 30 years ago. And the experts are quite on, in consensus that this will happen. We don't know really how fast and at what level the world population will level off, but the fast growth will be over in this century. I started with this because this is a very important economic impact that will come beyond Gavi's work, reducing child mortality, increasing acceptance for use of contraceptives and family planning, and then countries can gain the demographic dividend, which is so important to improve education and health service in general, and not the least for economic growth. So, if I show this then in my classical bubbles here, eh, and I selected two countries where we have representatives here today. Eh, I have, each bubble here is a country, this is United States, this is Japan. The colors here are Asia red, Europe yellow, America green, and Africa blue. Huh? And on this axis down here, I have size of family. Two children, four... No, it's nothing funny. My teacher used to point it like this when I was in primary school. <laughs> I learned a lot from that. I'm not convinced that electronics always is better. Huh? My teacher was very successful pointing with this. Four, six large families. Here, child mortality. 100 dying per 1,000 born, 200 dying, 300 dying. 50 years ago, there was a lot of countries where one child in three was dying. And indeed, Senegal was one of those countries 50 years ago. Ghana was, as estimates are documented, slightly better off. But we could see that at that time we really had a developing world, developing countries with large families and high child mortality. And as a result of the colonial period, another part, the West, the developed, the industrialized, that had small family and low child mortality. But that was to change. And one of the drivers was the vaccines. Not only the development of vaccines, but the gradual effective access to vaccines all over the world. So let me show you the classical runner and keep an eye on Ghana and Senegal as we go forward. Uh, here you can see uh, that child mortality indeed after independence starts to stop in Senegal and all, uh, start to drop here and it drops also in Ghana and then family planning starts here. They go for smaller families and they follow after China and India there and the other countries and these are really two successful African countries. They have gone more than half of the way and there they are today. Can you see starting from up here 
wanting to come down to very low child mortality and family of a size that will enable good education for everyone and um, good economic growth for the countries. It's a truly amazing change we have seen in the world. And I could take away those trails like this to show you more clearly that Ghana and Senegal indeed are two of the successful countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And, and uh, let me do one thing with Ghana, to just graphically show you what the president just told us, that there are differences within the countries, which today is the main challenge rather than the average of the country. And if I split Ghana into its five income quintile based on the last DHS survey, you see the upper income quintile that goes with high education is in the middle of the successful Africa. We know Ghana is doing very well in its front. And then there's one quintile here, one quintile here. And here is the group that the president mentioned, the hard to reach, which today are both in the slum and in the most remote rural areas. This is indeed important that we not only look at country averages. The MDG proce process d has driven us too much to look at country averages. We must drill down and look within countries. And perhaps data on immunization is the best one to follow how access works within the country. Now, uh, uh, this I can show you a little more here what the challenge is and where the children are. These are the children below 15, 15 to 30, 30 to 45, 45 to 60, and 60 and above. Here, the red one is Asia, <coughs> this is Africa, this is America, and this is Europe. So I am this one up here, uh, above 60 in Europe. Uh. Now, as you can see, there is a big gap in the middle. Instead of a population pyramid, I left the gap in the middle. Because what will happen is that people like me, eventually, we will die. The rest will grow older, and they will have their children. And can you see? The children have stopped growing. The number of children have stopped growing. We are really at a position now where it should be possible quite fast to reach everyone with immunization because the number are not growing. But watch out, when the old dies, the other grow older, the number of children is increasing in Africa and decreasing in Asia. That's why the total number in the world remains the same. And here we go up like this, and this is what we can expect by 2085, more or less. It's important in this context to realize that children is the only age group in the world that is getting poorer and poorer by the year. All other age groups move to better wealth. As the number of children decrease in the better off countries and in the middle income countries, we have a move actually towards lower income. Look, this is the income distribution of the world. One dollar a day, ten dollar a day, and hundred dollar a day. This is Europe and America. In 1968, they were the front hump of the camel the rich hump, and here you had Africa and Asia, the poorer hump of the camel. It was a camel world, I used to say. Sorry for my simplification. They work good at students. You know? Maybe they help even you to remember the income distribution. This is what has happened. Look, the camel marched forward, Asia was successful, and then also Africa, and the camel died. It was reborn as a dromedary. We now live in a dromedary world. Huh? And, and this is $10 is the most common. But indeed, the distance from the worst of, the hardest to reach here, to the best of here, is even larger than ever before, in spite of the middle having been filled. I think this is important to realize that Gavi is an organization taking resources from this end, bypassing the middle, and then striving to get all the way out to the hardest to reach. And I think Gavi has been extremely uh, successful in this, and I'll try to show you why. Eh? Here we are back in this one, that one. Now, when I ask uh, at Gapminder Foundation, where I work now, where we teach about the world, we have started to measure how much people know about the world. And we started in Sweden and Britain, and the results were depressive. We asked 
How many children will there be in the world in the future? Will there be two billion by the end of this century, three or four? And you can see what they answered. Huh? And the right answer is this. Less than 10% have an idea about the development of the population in the world. On the other hand, you can be very happy as a professor in global health because you have a lot to do. Huh? And, and, and uh, um, uh, when I asked about child mortality in the world, I get this strange answer. Huh? This is in Sweden. We asked by randomly selected representative sample of 1,000 Swedes, and this is what they answered. And you know that the child mortality of the world is 5% today. And the average for the Swedes is something like 17.5, 175. They are way up high on this. If I plot child mortality here against money eh, and let the size of these bubbles be number of child deaths, the Swedish population think that child mortality in the world is equal to the worst country. So, dear minister, we have work to do. Eh? We have not only to motivate people, we must show the success. Those who, with their tax money, fund the vaccines, they don't know about the success. And this is a dangerous situation, and it must be difficult for politicians to be in this situation. We've asked about literacy rate also. This was the UK result, the percent who can read in the world. This was the student in UK. Huh? And you know that the right result today is 80% can read. What do they teach in the British universities? <laughs> eh? Have they all textbooks from the colonial time? We went to the zoo, and this is a result for the shimps in. <laughs> the shimps in London had six times more right answers than those with university degree. <laughs> Just to emphasize, sorry, sorry for making these jokes. It's the same in Sweden and also in Norway, by the way. Eh? Uh, so it's really problematic. And what do they know about vaccines? Let me show you the vaccines here. If I move over here, I can show you some of the most important trends in vaccines. Look here, it's measles. Eh? I have the, the privilege myself working in Mozambique as district medical officer to see measles vaccination being rolled out and that deadly disease disappearing in a few years when you could achieve a coverage. And, and, and in 1985, there were countries with very bad coverage down here eh, of measles vaccination. This is money on this axis. This is coverage of measles. But look what has been done. And the push here that Gavi has provided in the end, you know, vaccination has really become better. That's where we are today. An enormous improvement. Huh? And, and, and uh, do, um, behind this, just let me take two things which I really admire. And it is that Gavi have achieved to have not only now manufacturers in the high income countries, but also in middle and low income countries, and especially middle income countries, I would say. And they manage thereby to create a more efficient production system. It is indeed a business model. It's where the public money and the corporate money functions well together. Uh, and we have now a falling price of vaccines, also making it easier for countries uh, earlier on to pay themselves for the vaccine by, by creating this. And, and, and um, the graduation, I think, is very advanced. That, that Gavi has said that $1,500 we should start so countries can start covering more of their costs themselves. And it's not a stupid line, it is a zone, where you start before and then after the graduation you have a number of years. Maybe that has to be adjusted a little, maybe countries are different structures, but the idea is very nice because it's fact-based and, and data-driven, which is not the fact with OECD's duck land for, for age, uh, aid eligibility. Huh? I have never understood why $12,000 remains the line. Our Minister of Foreign Affairs tells me that intellectually I'm 100% right that it should be moved, and politically I'm 100% wrong. I'm begging him for 1% overlap. Eh? <laughs> 
but it's not even possible to discuss. I think Gavi is doing here an analysis and creating something which will be important far beyond immunization. So what do the Swedes think about this? We ask them, what is the percent of world's one-year-old children that are vaccinated against measles? We ask the total population, and this is what they said. Huh? And, and you know that the right answer is down here. This is very risky. They don't know. Huh? And we ask the university graduates, and at least in Sweden they are equal to the rest means that they stay out of university probably and not spend too much time there, so they don't have the negative effect they had in Britain, you know. <laughs> we have one to two percent of the Swedish population that know that we have 80 percent coverage. And they think it's 25 huh? percent. Look here. This is where Sweden thinks the line is. This is MCV, uh, measles vaccination, and the Swedes is here, this is Chad. Sweden on child mortality and vaccination thinks the world average corresponds to the worst of country. It's very dangerous. We have a combination of ignorance and arrogance in the richest countries that can make it shaky for politicians to keep the funding going in the way it must go and should go based on evidence. So here we have in 1985, that's more or less where this is. The population is about 30 years after reality. And this is, this is very, very difficult, and it's very risky for the future. Uh, I think I'll, I'll stop here at this time and say that there's an enormous importance to have that communication so that the money can be flowing steadily, especially now, as the president said, there are two no, new fantastic vaccines and even uh, for, for anti-cancer vaccine coming up. This flow of money should increase steadily and be planned for decades ahead. Congratulations for the achievements, Gavi, and good luck for the future.